And basically, this is the connection between wokeness, the success of woke culture, the success of cancel culture, and our legal system. Our legal system really since the 1960s and how, according to Hanania, basically woke culture and wokeness, as he interprets it, and I'll give you, I'll give you his definition or his description. It's not really a definition. Um, wokeness is being set up. In a sense, it's kind of an inevitable consequence. And one of the things he observes right early in the article, and, I, and again, I recommend, this is a substack, Richard Hanania, spelt like it sounds, Hanania. Um, Richard uh, identifies early on, he says, Republicans right now are primarily motivated, inspired by this idea of cancel culture and woke culture. But what do they suggest doing about it? And he says the answer to that is nothing other than talking about it. But they have no remedy, no political remedy, no remedy, if you will, in the law to fix it. All they do is talk about it. Indeed, when Biden was passing his big stimulus package, which basically spent, I don't know, $2 trillion and wasn't really stimulative, it you know, it expanded government control and government funding for a bunch of different things that you think Republicans would care about. They spent almost no time discussing it, not on Tucker, not on Fox, and not on, not, not on the floor of the Senate. Republicans were distracted by Dr. Seuss. They were distracted by wokeness. They were distracted by cancel culture. And yet, when you ask them, what should we do about it? They hum and they haw and they talk about, we should talk about it, we should discuss it. But they don't have a practical solution to cancer culture rooted in something they could do politically other than, by the way, other than we can restrict, restrict free speech. That's their solution to, um, to war culture is... Uh, Let's regulate, uh, regulate uh, big media, uh, sorry, big tech. Let's, um, uh, let's uh, go after Bezos so we can silence the Washington Post. Let's restrict free speech. That is the conservative answer to wokeness. And what Richard Hanania shows is no. There is a legal, regulatory, political origin to wokeness. And therefore, you can start combating this cultural phenomena through the legal system. So, as Wanda Freeman says, the Republican solution is to cancel the counselors, but that just buys into the, can into the cancer culture. That just legitimizes cancer culture. Hanania suggests that there's something deeper going on here. There's something deeper in the legal system, in the political system, and therefore, there are things a Republican president can do that would at least start changing the debate. And as he argues, it's taken 50 years, 50 years? Yeah, 50 years to get to the point where we are today, from where the initial momentum started, 50-something years. It might take a few decades to undo this, but at least you'd get a start. And you have to start, again, in the legal system. So here, so I, I think this is an incredibly important article. Um, now, again, it's not philosophical. It doesn't deal with the philosophical roots of, of wokeness, and it doesn't deal with the philosophical question about free speech or the philosophical questions around um, uh, racism and discrimination, the philosophical questions uh, uh, around postmodernism and why critical race theory or, ra or, or critical theory and why any of this could come to the forefront. It deals with the legal political issues. All right, so, um, <laughs> and, and, Anna, w why are you here? I mean, uh, th this is Anna M., who, is, who comes on and asks, um, 
insight objectivism questions uh, to try to antagonize me and, and to try to try to stir up the pot to create more fury. And she comes on to insult, right, to insult. So here's her insulting question. Like, we didn't know you'd cook up an excuse to decuse DeSantis or anyone else who fights the left. DeSantis is not fighting the left. DeSantis is fighting free speech. DeSantis is fighting for authoritarian power. DeSantis, in his, in his uh, uh, latest, uh, latest bill that basically would penalize social media, for, uh, for dumping a politician is basically, basically, you know, declaring politicians special. He is everything that the Constitution of the United States is not. He is everything that the founders were not. Yes, he's a, just based on this one bill, he's a bad guy. This is a bad, bad, bad bill. This is not fighting the left. This is buying into the left's premises. And, and, and accelerating uh, authoritarianism. Um, have you ever declared any Democrat disqualified for president? Yeah, all of them, basically. Have I ever liked a Democrat as president? No. Have I ever endorsed a Democrat for president? No. Have I ever thought a, a Democrat was qualified to be president? No. <laughs> but because I was anti-Trump, and because now I guess I'm anti-DeSantis, at least on this one issue, I am a lover of the left, obviously. God, get a brain, Anne. All right. Um, so let's go back to, uh, let's go back to uh, Richard Hanania, who's, this is, uh, this is quite, uh, uh, this is quite, uh, again, uh, an excellent article. All right. So he wants to first, he wants to first define, and you got to give credit to anybody who first wants to describe what it is that he's talking about. So he says, what is it that defines or describes wokeness? So he says, he thinks there are three components to wokeness, three components. The first component is, and I'm quoting the article, I believe that any disparities in outcome favoring whites or males over non-whites over women are caused by discrimination. So the idea that inequality of outcome is, can only be caused by discrimination. That's point number one in wokeness. And he, and he acknowledges that he's not here dealing with all the other issues like LGBTQ and, and so on. He's just sticking to the main ones, race and sex. Number two, so that's one. Any disparities of outcome, any outcome that it, that it, where there's disparities between races or sexes has to be because of discrimination. Number two, the speech of those who would argue against this number one, the speech that would argue against discrimination as always being the cause, should be restricted should be banned. In the interest of overcoming the disparities. And of course, we have to, we have to take care of the emotional state of, uh, of those who might be offended by anything we might say. Right? So, so the safety and emotional well-being of the so-called victimized group, the, the, the group that outcomes are less of and therefore must be discriminated against. And number three, we must create bureaucracies that reflect point one and point two. So this bureaucracies that are working through the law, through the legal system, or through the private system, we'll see how this affects the private world, to overcome disparities, and manage, manage is a nice word, manage speech and social relations so that people don't get offended and so that we can keep the workplace such that people can overcome these disparities. They don't have to give in to it. Now, I think this is a great breakdown, right? So the first is all discriminate, all disparities are caused by discrimination. Second is, you can't claim otherwise. 
You cannot claim otherwise. Speech that claims otherwise, arguments that claim otherwise, should be banned. And three, we need to establish bureaucracies in the public and private sector in order to make sure that disparities don't exist anymore and that we cannot speak about them to the extent that they do exist. Or we cannot speak about them or assign causes to them that are not about discrimination to the extent that they continue to exist. Now, I know that all of this is how the woke culture works. Right? There's a difference in, um, I, I don't know, we, we, talked about, uh, we talked about education and wokeness. There's a difference in test results between black kids and white kids. It must be discrimination. But, but maybe it has something to do with, um, with what? With the quality of the schools. Oh, you can't say that. That's insulting to the schools. And even if it is the quality of the schools, the quality of the schools are determined by discrimination. And if you don't believe that, because science doesn't show that, then we don't want to hear you. You're obviously a racist. Be quiet. And we're going to silence you. Wokeness in healthcare, different outcomes in healthcare, different, uh, di different. Uh, uh, Achie achieving different things in healthcare, that must be because of discrimination between men, women, uh, doctors, uh, maybe of different races. That must be discrimination. We must silence and we must build bureaucracies to stop this. Now, this sounds new, and, and you could, uh, wokeness seems to be, people want to date wokeness to around 2010. Uh, it seems like the, um, the, 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 the people who are looking into this kind of the history of, of wokeness. Um, attribute the rise of wokeness to, uh, to uh, the internet and to, uh, to social media, the speed at which it happens, the easy silencing, the cancel culture can happen over social media. Maybe that's true. But the fact is that all of these attributes, the discrimination, the silencing, the bureaucracy, are, all can be traced back to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Civil Rights Act of 1964 banned discrimination based on race and gender. And Congress at the time basically thought, well, right, this will basically remove explicit discrimination, intended discrimination. And it'll be easy, and we'll get over it, and that's it. Courts and regulators since 1964 have basically expanded the concept of non-discrimination to mean almost anything that advantages one group over another. So well before cancel culture, well before white fragility and white guilt, the idea that discrimination could apply to any advantaged group or disadvantaged group was already starting to be instituted into law. Uh, in, a, uh, in a watershed case, in, uh, it's called Griggs versus Duke Power in 1971, the Supreme Court ruled that intelligent tests, because they were not shown to be directly related to job performance, could not be used in hiring since blacks scored lower on them and it did not matter whether there was any intent to discriminate. So from 1971 on, it doesn't matter in your hiring practice whether you intend to discriminate. The only thing that matters is, is the outcome unbalanced? This is called the doctrine, the doctrine of disparate impact. That is, if a particular rule, a particular test, a particular activity results in disparate impact, that is, this results in different outcomes, it is by definition discriminatory and must be banned. 
So for example, um, criminal background checks, it turns out, disproportionately prevent blacks from being hired because they tend to have more criminal offenses, more crime sheets. This is a case that the Trump administration settled with dollar generals for $6 million. So even the, dollar, even the Trump administration basically litigated this. The Obama administration went after schools for disciplining black and white students at different rates. Didn't turn out very well. Police departments, fire departments, other institutions use gender norm tests. You know gender norm tests? Tests that both men and women can pass so that the test cannot be accused of discriminating. I'm sure the criminals... The criminals can be relied on, uh, you know, Richard Wright, uh, to go easy on female cops on account of their sex. So the idea is that the law, the law that we live with, the law that we've been living with for 50 years, basically says that if a test you give results in disparate outcomes, you are then guilty of discrimination. And you can be sued in courts, and in the court, as the, the lawsuit of the Trump administration again, dollar against uh, Dollar General shows. And there is a financial cost to this. Now, once this was in place, this, of course, started to expand beyond government into the private sector. Initially, it, was just, it, it kind of applied to government, but it, it, it started expanding into the private sector. Right? Executive Order 11246. I didn't even know this was an executive order, but this is an executive order, 11246, signed by President Johnson. Right? So in 1967, eight, it required all government contractors and subcontractors who did over $10,000 in government business to quote, and notice the language, take affirmative action. This is where the concept of affirmative action comes from. Take affirmative action to ensure that applicants are employed and that employees are treated during employment without regard to their race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Sex was actually added Later, in 1969, Richard Nixon, a Republican, signed Executive Order 11478, which forced affirmative action onto the federal government itself. So from 1969, affirmative action applies to the government and to basically all of government contractors. Now, what does, what is discriminating, right, what does it mean that employees be treated during employment without regard to their race? How do we tell? Well, again, we look at outcomes. We look at outcomes. Aff affirmative action assumed that but for discrimination, statistical parity among racial and ethnic groups would be the norm. So if you take out discrimination, if there are 40% blacks in the population in a particular city and 40% whites and 20% Hispanics, then that would, be, that would be their distribution in every job in that community. And if it's not, then the cause must be discrimination. Affirmative action says, if the burden is on you, the employer, to show that you made every effort to match that demographic. So here you see the government instituting into the legal system and therefore into the culture and into behaviors of businesses the idea that outcome is what matters, not your intent, not whether you actually discriminated or not, but what matters is outcome. And if the outcome isn't 
even or matching the population, then you have discriminated and you are liable. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at yourunbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals. Uh, and uh, and show your support for all for, for for the work for the value hopefully you're receiving from this, and uh, and of course don't forget if you're not a subscriber even if you even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up you'll know what shows are on when they're on you'll get notified right so um, yes like. Share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.